views expressed on this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers, and are not necessarily those of this station, its management, or other advertisers. You're listening to Transformation Talk Radio. This show's audio was via a Skype call. Welcome to Knowledge Book Radio with Marge Patasic. Marge was searching for the purpose of her life and the truth that would tie everything together to make sense of what was taught and what was happening on our planet, the fire that was creating all the smoke. Through many experiences, she was finally led to the knowledge book that provided all the answers. Marge is now talking about this gift to humanity on Knowledge Book Radio, so all can be united in peace, love, and harmony. This live call-in show at 1-800-930-2819 is amazing. So get ready to hear about the Knowledge Book. Here's your host, Marge Patasek. Hello, everyone. I'm Marge Batazic, and you are listening to the Knowledge Book Radio with Marge Batazic on Transformation Talk Radio. And for the next hour, as we have been doing for the past couple of months, we will continue our series of Omega Talks. And these are usually given on the fourth Tuesday of every month. And this whole Omega Talks program is part of the unification program of the Call to Friendship Association that is mentioned in the Knowledge Book. In these talks, what we do is we connect science and spirituality. We connect and talk about world knowledge and connect it, link it to the Omega Dimension, which is the 19th dimension. And this dimension has been open to humanity for the first time through the Knowledge Book. And this week, our world topic of conversation and connection to the spiritual dimension, the 19th dimension, is emotions. But before we go on, just wanted to remind you that the general U.S. website for the Knowledge Book is www.usa.theknowledgebook.net. The Turkish World Brotherhood Union website is www.dkbdavidkiteboy-mevlana.org.tr. My own contact information, telephone number for texting or calling is 973-787-7035. And of course, my email address is mmjpmarymarryjohnpeter99 at gmail.com. And the Call to Friendship website is www.calltofriendship.org. Okay, so... Please do email or text me with any questions or call me with any questions that arise from today's topics or from previous shows. And any topics, questions for future shows, of course, are very welcome. And we'll be covering the questions we've received so far um, probably in the next show. Okay, so let's start with emotions. And of course, when we talk about a topic, there are always questions that come to mind. And with, for me, as far as emotions were concerned, what I wanted to know is what are they? What are emotions? And what functions do they perform in our life, in our bodies? And is there something that affects us differently based on negative or positive emotions that we feel? And are emotions intrinsic? Does everyone have them? Is, is this something that we cannot do without or is this something that we can eliminate completely? And when emotions arise, there's always something going on in our brains, whether we're thinking or automatically reacting. So what are the associated brain functions that come into play when emotions arise? And of course, the other question I have is, what is the role of emotions in our evolution? Do they play a role in our evolution? Do they not play a role in evolution? How important is this role as far as our evolution is concerned? Okay. So, question number one, what are emotions? Emotions are defined as a natural instinctive state of mind deriving from one's circumstances, mood, or relationship with others. 
excuse me, they are an instinctive or intuitive feeling as distinguished from reasoning or knowledge. Another view of emotion is an it's a complex psychological state that involves three distinct components, a subjective experience, a physiological response, and a behavioral or expressive response. <clears throat> so you have two different views. And in here it sees, it seems to me that the definition itself says that emotions are intrinsic and they're instinctive, meaning they're part of a hardwired uh, system that we have, a bodily system or our physical system. They're also connected to intuition and they're separate from reasoning or knowledge. So we can possibly now be able to control our emotions or go away from emotions through using our brain. But emotions themselves are intrinsic, they're instinctive and intuitive and tied to our uh, physical state. Now, what are the basic emotions? The actual concept of what basic emotions are or possibly could be goes way back to the first century Chinese text called the Book of Rights. And as we all know, there are many different emotions that have been identified over time. However, now most scientists do agree that there are six basic emotions, love, joy, surprise, anger, sadness, and fear. Now, those are the six basic ones. I know that we are accustomed to experiencing and seeing around as people going through many different kinds of emotions, and many secondary emotions are then derived from these six basic ones. So when we take each individual emotion by itself, there is a, there is a gamut. There is something that is small as far as that emotion is concerned. It becomes more and more intense. So in terms of joy, we go from serenity to ecstasy, from for trust, we go from acceptance to admiration, from fear, we go from apprehension to terror, in surprise, we go from distraction to amazement, in sadness, we go from pensiveness to grief, in disgust, that goes from boredom to loathing, and from anger, we go from annoyance to rage. And anticipation, we go from interest to vigilant. Now, these emotions that I've just mentioned, anticipation, trust, surprise, and disgust, and sadness, they all are emotions that come to be by combining two other emotions. So, disapproval comes when we combine sadness and surprise. When we combine fear and surprise, we have awe. When we combine fear and trust, we get submission. When we combine trust and joy, we get love. And when joy and anticipation unite, we get optimism. And when we have anticipation and anger, we have aggressiveness. And when we go, when we combine anger and disgust, we get contempt. And ag disgust and sadness gives us remorse. So we come through and get many different kinds of emotions based on the state that they are in, in which dimensions are the underpinning emotions that cause the other emotions to arise. So we have a cascading effect of <clears throat> emotions arising and combining and becoming something different. Now, what are the functions of emotions? I don't know if you have seen the Disney Pixar film Inside Out. Joy, if you remember, is the primary driver of the control center that represents the excited, explorative nature of normal developing youth. Now, Joy, of course, is the one that always wants to be happy, is always optimistic, always looking on the positive side of things, and always wants to be happy and in control. And that kind of ties in with the rest of us because we always want to be happy. We always want to be on the upside. We always want to be um, on the joy rather than the fear or any other emotion. Now, fear and disgust are actually there to keep us safe. And they protect us from predators. So if we're fearful of something, we will stay away and we will get away and we will not get caught by the tiger. We will not get caught by the people who are trying to plot against us and we'll be able to keep ourselves safe. Now, disgust itself protects us from being poisoned, both physically and socially. So we, when we see something that looks unappetizing to us, we don't taste things. We don't put things in our mouth that looks unappetizing and unhealthy. And also, 
when we have disgust towards other people, it's usually in the situation where those individuals are toxic that could potentially harm us and harm our psychological state. So an anger, of course, when it comes out as an outburst, it actually is able to control, to neutralize, to devalue, to punish, to warn, to threaten, to intimidate, and to avenge. So there are many people who consider anger to be a very important emotion that allows us to to win in a situation and allows us to be able to handle other situations that are usually unhandleable, if there is such a word, and allows us to assert ourselves, whether in a more gentle or a more strong fashion. Now, again, we were talking about emotions, and there's a different view of emotion as to what they are. So we'll go into what the elements of emotions are, and there are three of them. Number one is the subjective experience. This is something that happens to us, and we are feeling something, we're we're in some kind of an emotion. Then that emotion has some kind of physiological response. There is something that goes on in our body. Either our heart races, or we get sweaty palms, or we freeze or we shiver, or whatever it is, and then no matter what the subjective and the physiological response is, we then have a choice. We then have the ability to have a behavioral response, and that behavioral response basically needs to be governed by the brain, by our intellect, and by our logic. So let's break this down little by little. So experts actually believe that there are basic universal emotions that are experienced by people all over the world. And this is regardless background or culture. Researchers also believe that experiencing emotion can be highly subjective, meaning someone may experience the same thing as someone else. However, one person will cry, another person will laugh, another person will not react at all visibly. So life experiences like getting married, having a baby, and starting a new job can have a variety of emotional responses depending on the individual, their culture, and their life experience. Then, of course, we have the physiological response. And if most of us at one point or another felt our heart flutter or our stomach lurch from anxiety or fear... And you know that, and we know that, emotions can cause strong physiological reactions. Many physiological responses that we experience during an emotion, like sweaty palms or racing heartbeat, are basically regulated by the sympathetic nervous system, and this is a branch of the autonomic nervous, autonomic nervous system. So this is an automatic Response. This is something that the body itself controls, so we don't have much control over it. So adrenaline is produced in times of stress, while oxytocin and endorphins are released during emotions like love and happiness. And these, of course, especially stress and adrenaline, our muscles tighten, energy is sent out to the limbs, to the external portion of the body, and we have an increased sensitivity to pain. However, oxytocin and endorphins, here the muscles relax, energy is sent to the uterus, decrease sensitivity to awareness and pain. So this is the collect and protect or love hormone, okay? Now the physiological response, no matter what happens on the automatic reflex reaction side, both the emotion and the physiological response, we have the ability to control through our prefrontal cortex, our thinking logic, uh, and react to a situation based on thinking and logic as opposed to gut instinct and reflex action. So the autonomic nervous system controls involuntary body responses like blood flow and digestion. The sympathetic nervous system controls the body's flight or fight reactions. And these are the bodily systems that automatically prepare your body, our body, to run from danger or to face the threat. Now, the prefrontal cortex, as I mentioned before, is the one that will override, if we give it a chance to do so, 
and say everything is okay. I don't have to, you know, punch back when somebody is punching me. I don't have to respond in anger. So depending on who you are and where you come from, some people show complete lack of emotion, even though they may be boiling on the inside and wanting to say all kinds of things on the inside is a response to whatever has been, you know, tossed, said to them or the situation that they have actually witnessed. Now, the hippocampus is a part of the brain that actually regulates memory and emotions, and the amygdala is the one that turns on the fight or flight reflex, and this is the one that also stores memories in the brain. So the higher, what has been found, that the higher your emotional response, the stronger your emotional response, the longer the memory will actually last and the, and the quicker the memory will actually be stored. And the connection between the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus and the amygdala is a weak connection, meaning you have to have really strong willpower and training to overcome and to be able to regulate your response to a situation while the hippocampus and the amygdala have very strong effect and they're the ones that control the instinctual, the reflex action or fight or flight. Okay. Now, of course, the physiological response. There have been studies done on the physiology of emotion and they were focused initially on the autonomic responses. However, research, recent searches have found, or recent research has found, and focused on the role of the brain in our emotion. And what they saw is that brain scans that have done on the brain show that the amygdala plays an important role in emotion, particularly fear. And the amygdala is a tiny, almond-shaped structure of the brain that is linked to memory and emotion. So these are connected to the physiological, the emotional side of things, the initial, the intuitive, the gut reaction to whatever is going on around us. However, the behavioral response is the actual expression of emotion, whether you actually express the emotion that you're feeling or not. And what the research has been suggesting is that many expressions are universal. So if you're happy, you'll be smiling. And if you're not happy... Or if you're angry, there'll be a frown on your face. Or if you're sad, there'll be a frown on your, on your face and you'll have a sad expression on your face. However, in these expressions, society and culture play a big part on how we express and interpret emotions. So I know many different cultures view things differently. I know that most of us heard about the British stiff upper lip. No matter what happens, you do not express emotion, do not show emotion on your face. You control everything tightly. And there are those cultures where whatever emotion you're feeling, you just gush out with tears, you go gush out with laughter, you gush out with whatever it is that you're feeling, and you express everything that you are feeling. But that depends on what your culture is and what you're coming and what your training has been. A lot of it has to do with conditioning. Now, there are also, there's a difference between emotions and moods. Even though people sometimes use the same words, and these use these words interchangeably, meaning they say emotions when they mean mood, or they use mood for emotions, but psychologists have a different viewpoint, and they make very specific distinction between the two. And the psychologists think that an emotion is normally quite short-lived, but it is intense. And emotions are also likely to have a definite and indefinable cause, an identifiable cause, I'm sorry. So emotions are short but intense and have a reason that you can see and identify. However, a mood is defined as something much milder than an emotion. However, it lasts much longer. And it's much harder to identify the specific cause of the mood that you're feeling at that particular point in time. Now, what are the health impacts of negative emotions? I know some of us 
are always in fear, always worried, always, oh, someone's going to cheat me, someone's going to rob me, we're going to get robbed, we're going to get killed. If you go to New York City, you got to be off the streets by 8 o'clock because everybody comes out with guns at that time. Some people have a, you know, this black cloud that's always raining on them. And what happens is these kinds of negative attitudes and feelings of helplessness and hopelessness can and do create chronic stress. And this chronic stress upsets the body's hormone balance. It actually depletes the brain chemicals required for happiness and damages the immune system. And science has now identified that stress shortens our telomeres, and these are the end caps of our DNA strands, and that ages us much more quickly. And if you have a poorly managed or repressed anger or hostility, this is also related to health conditions such as hypertension, cardiovascular disease, digestive disorders, atherosclerosis, and infection. So negative emotions have a very high impact on our body, causing ultimately stress and could cause cancer. Now, those who read the knowledge book know that stress and negativity actually do or does cause cancer. However, it is spiritual strength that is recommended as the remedy and cure. And this is actually corroborated by scientific studies being conducted currently that show that a positive attitude of happiness, of being spiritually strong, meaning having a higher frequency, having a higher resonance level as far as our physical body is concerned, resonance energy is concerned, gives a much better outcome as far as the prognosis and length of life with cancer. Or sometimes it is the case that this kind of an attitude actually eliminates the cancer. Now what spiritual strength means as far as the knowledge book is concerned, it is an evolutionary energy and frequency level at which the strong cancer organisms cannot thrive or survive. And again, those who are reading in the, reading the knowledge book or who are in the knowledge book studies, they gradually rise to the evolution level that protects them from cancer causing stress and the radioactive components of the space and time dimensions. So when we read the knowledge book, when we are part of the reading, book, reading program, when we are part of the knowledge book studies, all those studies and the reading of the knowledge book and the work with the knowledge book actually allows our bodies to gradually rise in evolution level, rise in consciousness level, rise in frequency and energy level. And as many of you know, disease can only survive at lower frequencies, at lower energies higher energy levels that are given by the knowledge book that actually we incorporate and we change our physical structure and we change our ability to deal with everything, it eliminates the stress and, and actually protects us from the radio because there are dimensions, whatever knowledge we get from whatever dimension we're getting it from, they contain radioactive components. And this is the dimension that we are living in. We are in the space and time dimension. So the knowledge book eventually increases our magnetic field, makes it stronger, and we are put into a protective um, bubble, as it were, and all the negative, possibly dangerous, radioactive components of energy is blocked, and we only get whatever it is beneficial for us and for our bodies. Now, what about we've covered the negative emotions and our effect on health. What about positive emotions in our health? We kind of touched about this, but we'll go a little bit deeper into it. So people who have a good emotional health are aware of their thoughts, they're aware of their feelings, and they are aware of their behavior. Research suggests that having a positive outlook can benefit your physical health. And positive emotions expand our awareness and open us up to new ideas so we can grow and add to our toolkit for survival. And this was something that was said by Dr. Barbara Fredrickson. Okay. To continue on positive emotions and our health. People who are emotionally well have fewer negative emotions and bounce back from difficulties faster. And this quality is called resilience. 
meaning whatever happens to you, even if it is a negative amount, a negative um, or hurtful situation, you will bounce back and will take it, handle it, and go on and not dwell on it. And not let it fester and become something worse. And research has found a link between upbeat mental state and positive emotions. And that led to improved health, lower blood pressure, reduced risk of heart disease, healthier weight, better blood sugar levels, and longer life. Okay. And what's, what scientists have found by using brain imaging, neuroscientists found that positive emotions can trigger reward pathways located deep within the brain, including in an area known as the ventral striatum. And as per Dr. Richard Davidson, individuals who are more into positive emotions have a lasting activation of that ventral striatum. And the longer the activation lasts, the greater are the feelings of well-being and health. So happiness in and of itself broadens our focus and expands our thinking. Now what about love? It is only recently that psychiatrists, psychiatrists, psychologists, I'm sorry, that psychologists have begun to appreciate the benefits of happiness and positive emotion. Benefits that include everything from enhanced creativity to improved immune system function. However, as stated in the knowledge book, love is not a feeling tied to our ego, egos and desires, but a frequency characterized by giving, expecting nothing in return. So love initially is something that is an intrinsic emotion that's tied to our bodies, that is tied to our desires, tied to um, our ability to procreate and make sure that we replace ourselves as we pass on. However, that is just the beginning. That is the first step of love. There are many gradations. There are many gradations of love, and we have family love. We have um, divine love. We have many different levels of love. But the love that is mentioned in the knowledge book is not a love, but is defined as a vibration. It is a frequency. And this frequency can be characterized or can be seen in people or this frequency you know is held by an individual when they are able to give something to you without any strings attached. You know that this is a gift. You can do with it what you want. And you know that you will not be expected to give anything in return. So this is the true meaning of the love frequency as defined by the knowledge book. Now they found something also very interesting. There is a study that was done by the UCLA's Mindfulness Awareness Research Center, and they said that regularly expressing gratitude literally changes the molecular structure of the brain. It keeps the gray matter functioning and makes us healthier and happier. They found through experiments that when participants reported grateful feelings, their brains showed activity in a set of regions located in the medial prefrontal cortex, and this is an area in the frontal lobe of the brain where the two hemispheres meet. And this is an area of the brain that's associated with understanding other people's perspectives, with empathy, and with feelings of relief. And this is also connected to the systems in the body and brain that regulate emotion and support the process of stress relief. So if you've ever done journaling, if you've ever uh, followed any of the recommendations for um, being happy, people always say be grateful for what it is that you have and at the end of the day make a list of what it is that you're grateful for that day. And that will lead definitely to much greater happiness. Now, what is the underlying cause of what the emotional effects produce? So there was an experiment that was run. There was one colony of cells that was living in one Petri dish, and that colony of cells, same similar cells, were divided into two Petri dishes. Now, one dish had nutrients and the other had toxins. So one Petri dish Nutrients were introduced, and into the other Petri dish, toxins were introduced. And both these Petri dishes, with the same colony of cells, the divided colony of cells, were put into an incubator at the same time. 
and after a while they found when they examined the petri dishes that the cells that had the nutrients moved towards the nutrients while the cells with the toxins moved away from the toxins. So the conclusion is that when a cell sees something that gives it growth, that allows it to grow, it moves towards this positive signals with wide open arms to take it in. And when a cell sees toxins, it moves away from the negative signal and closes down and goes into protection mode. It does not grow anymore. It stops growth and therefore will not ever be able to be in contact with that toxin. So bottom line is an individual cell can be either in an open growth state or a closed protection state, but you can't, the cell cannot be in both states at once. When we think of growth, we usually think of, you know, a child developing into an adolescent, developing into an adult, and so on and so forth, but that's not what this means. When your body is in growth mode, when your cells are in growth mode, they are able to replace themselves. Now, every one of our cells and every one of our body, in every one of our bodies, is replaced every day. So I think most of you know that our entire body is replaced every seven years. So if we are in growth mode, even if that cell is sick, it is replaced by a healthier cell, which means when you are in growth mode, you're in health mode. You are continuing your healthy division. You're maintaining your body in its optimum state. However, if you go into a protective and closed non-growth mode, that means the body cannot repair itself. The body cannot grow and it deteriorates. Okay. Now, the human body itself is composed of billions of cells. Some say trillions of cells. Now, these cells are held together through their vibrations And the human body itself is a community of individually conscious and evolving cells that love and serve the human. This comes from the knowledge book. And just like the cells comprising it, the human body also opens to the positive signal. It is able to grow and to maintain health. However, the body shuts off growth and goes into protection mode when faced with what it perceives as negative signals or stress. And how does this mechanism work? Well... This is something that's called the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. The hypothalamus is the brain area that interprets perception. And when it perceives a positive signal, then the pituitary is notified to send signals to grow and maintain health to all the cells of the body. So the hypothalamus is the one that's responsible for interpretation of whatever is perceived by the brain perception of a positive signal, then the pituitary continues to send signals, okay, everything's fine, guys, you can keep growing, you can keep being healthy, you can keep maintaining health in all the cells of the body. However, if the hypothalamus sees a threat situation, then the pituitary sends the signals to the adrenal glands, and the adrenal glands then release stress hormones that in turn cause the blood to be shunted from the internal organs, and these would be the function of growth, maintenance, etc. And it sends the blood to the extremities, to the arms and the legs, to prepare for flight or fight. Stress hormones also shut off the immune system, leaving the body open to opportunistic organisms like bacteria, viruses, parasites, and cancer. Now, it has been shown many times that we all have cancer cells in our body. We all have uh, parasites in our body. We all have bacteria and viruses in our body. It is only at the time, however, if we have a strong immune system, our strong immune system handles all of that, meaning it eliminates the bacteria, the viruses, the parasites, and the cancer. However, in the case of stress and negativity, the body goes into protection mode. It stops growing, stops maintaining health, And the immune system then is also stopped and shut off. And therefore, all these opportunistic um, organisms take over and we get sick or we get cancer. But But that's not the only thing that happens. Stress hormones also shunt the brain blood supply from the front of the brain, which is consciousness intelligence, to the paleomammalian brain. And this is our old reptilian, this is our old animal brain 
that is fight or flight, that it does not have intelligence, and it functions basically on an instinctive reflex reaction mode. Fight or flight, kill or be killed. This is that brain. So this whole process, we either... Our brain, based on our perception, based on what our hypothalamus um, perceives, it sends signals either to let our bodies grow, let our bodies restore ourselves, let our bodies maintain health, or it shuts the body down. It shuts down the supervisory uh, system and goes into fight or flight and stress hormone levels skyrocket. Okay. Now, perception. It all depends on what the hypothalamus actually perceives. So how do we perceive perception? There is one cartoon that I saw that basically described this perfectly. There is, depending on where you look at it, something laying down on the ground that's a number. It could be a nine, it could be a six. Now, if you're at the circular part of the nine, then the person at the head would say, well, this is actually a six. But the person who's got the tail of the nine, from that angle, it'll see a nine. So it depends. What you perceive is depends on your viewpoint. Now, fascicle four of the knowledge book states that in whichever way you look at it, in whichever way you think of it, that is the way it will be. If you think it is good, it will be always good. And if you think it is bad, it will always be bad. Therefore, it is not the actual state of anything or situation, but our perception of it that determines whether we are in growth, maintenance, and health mode, or we are in stress and allowing opportunistic organisms to flourish, causing disease. The knowledge book also states that everything is proceeding towards the perfect, therefore it is our perception of something as negative that creates the negativity and therefore our stress. So if you think it's going to be great, it's going to be great. If you think it's going to be bad, definitely will be bad because you will yourself sabotage it. And it doesn't matter what happens. Whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, it is your perception of it, it is our perception of it that determines whether we continue in health mode or if we go into stress, allowing these opportunistic organisms to flourish and cause disease in ourselves. When we think that everything that has happening is perfect, when we accept everything as it is because it is, then stress basically disappears. And we are always happy. So we, once again, we'll talk about the mammalian brain. So emotions like fear and anger and love are connected to the limbic system, sometimes called the paleomammalian or primordial brain. And this is the innermost part of the current brain structure, which is then surrounded by the higher level functioning cerebral cortex, which is the seat of consciousness and intellect. Now, the main purpose of this system, this mammalian brain system, is self-preservation and survival in the world dimension. And if we are in that mode, then we are, then we are the human version 1.0. And we are at zero frequency, third world dimension, 12th energy dimension, and first solar system. This is our baseline for being human. Below that, you're an animal, but... At zero frequency, third world dimension, 12th energy dimension, this is the baseline human version 1.1. And this is a self-centered being driven by emotions, reflex, reflex actions, and ego. So this is our mammalian brain, the innermost part of our brain, and this is how it functions, and this is human at its initial state. Okay. However... Human version 1.0 needed an upgrade, so the celestial authorities devised various plans to improve on the model. Well, because at version 1.0, we are no better than animals of killer of being killed, survival of the fittest. I can do damage to anyone and everyone as long as no damage is being done to me. As long as I am the victor and I have the biggest share of everything and I can live 
It doesn't matter who dies. Okay, so, however, it took a while before the celestial authorities actually found something that worked on humans. There were many plans that did fail. However, it was the plan of the historical sons, in other words, those individuals, those beings who actually succeeded in the previous plans, that, and they arrived at the level of their spiritual totality, which is the eighth dimension, and that's what finally worked, and humans began to change. So during the last 6,000 years evolution program in the religious dimension, this evolution program was fueled by the sacred books that were given over time, and those individuals that had gone through the 6,000-year evolution program are now at the threshold of entering the advanced dimension. So this is where we are. We're no longer human version 1.0 unless we allow our emotions to rule, like in um, Inside Out. It is the emotions that are ruling that individual. Being behind the control panel, intellect has nothing to do with anything. It is emotions that rule. So that is version 1.0. However, those of those of you and those of you who actually have gone through this 6,000-year evolution being fueled by the religious texts, by the religious books, are now at the threshold of entering the advanced dimensions. However, in the advanced dimensions, there is no room for ego. The mammalian brain has to go. It can no longer function. In the advanced dimension, there is only love, there is service, there is harmony, and there is unity. But when you think about this, protection is unnecessary, as we will have attained immortality, which means we do not need to fear of losing ourselves. We do not fear death, because death will be eliminated. Now, as presented in the knowledge book, although the human's energy form may have needed evolution, its essence, the spark of its creator, of the spiritual totality has always been perfect. Throughout its evolution, the human has been on a journey to find its essence and to attain it, while concurrently engaging more of its intellect and logic, therefore, and thereby becoming more altruistic. Our journey is towards our essence to be equivalent to our evolution level. So in other words, when our essence, which has been perfect from the get-go, finally equals our evolution level, which is at the seventh dimension, then we actually gain entry to the eighth dimension, which is a spiritual totality. And at that point, we are able to then merge with the spiritual totality and our energy, our evolution frequency, is equal to our spiritual totality, and we are actually genuine humans. And this is where the law of acceptance comes in. This is where the law of acceptance helps us to basically eliminate the stress in our life. Because in the law of acceptance, everything is positive. So our essence is alpha, which is love and the spiritual dimension, while our intellect is beta, the logic or the lordly dimension. And acceptance is defined as having our alpha and beta dimensions in balance. And this is what is actually defined as the unification of the essence, heart, and the intellect. When we are in accordance with the law of acceptance, we are always happy. We are always in growth and health mode. We have the consciousness of what to do. We know that everything that exists, all the experiences we go through, can only result in a positive outcome. And that, of course, leads to the perfection, and that leads to stress disappearing and us always being happy happy. So emotions actually equal the world dimension. The evolution of a human starts at zero frequency, third world dimension. This is the dimension where self-preservation is our primary goal and emotions are both intrinsic and crucial. We need to be able to preserve ourselves to be able to to live and to be able to um, produce offspring. However, as we evolve through the path's design, emotions become shackles. They actually imprison us in the world dimension, not allowing us to progress to higher dimensions. In the advanced dimensions, ego and emotions are not needed as we will have achieved immortality and we will have arrived at our true home. In higher dimensions, to repeat service and unity, guided by the triangle of intellect, logic, awareness, our primary and even the vibration of true love disappears. 
as love is recommended for those who will evolve. This comes from fascicle 12. And now it looks like it's a good time to take a break. And you've been listening to the Knowledge Book Radio with March Batazic. And to remind everyone that the U.S. Wick Knowledge Book website is www.usa.thenowledgebook.net. The telephone numbers for questions and topics is 973-787-7035. My email address is mmjpmarymarijohnpeter99 at gmail.com. And when we come back, we will continue with emotions. We'll summarize what we have just covered. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. The Truth is Funny, Shift Happens with Colette Marie Steffen is excited to welcome Karen Benton as a monthly guest host. Tune in on the third Wednesday of each month at 8 a.m. Pacific time to regain confidence and trust in your capacity to create change in your life, your health, your family, and your well-being. Karen Benton is a mother, nurse practitioner, certified body talk practitioner, Franklin Method instructor, and owner of Limitless Living LLC. For more information about Karen, visit KarenBenton.com. Our angels and animals are always working for and around us. Darcy Pariso knew from an early age she felt this incredible presence that was confirmed for her in a Reiki Level 1 course. From then on, she has honed her skills and dedicated her talents to providing answers, inspiration, and tools for people to move past limiting blocks and past traumas to truly live a life of happiness. For more information about working with Darcy, visit DarcyPariso.com. Tune in to Knowledge Book Radio with host Marge Potasic each Tuesday at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern on TransformationTalkRadio.com. Through many experiences, Marge was led to the Knowledge Book, a gift to humanity in its transition to the Golden Age, and it provided the truth and the answers. She now shares information from the Knowledge Book with you each week on TransformationTalkRadio.com. For more information, visit USA.TheKnowledgeBook.net. To find answers to life's questions, you need to look within yourself. Dr. Glenna Rice brings your questionable conversations on Transformation Talk Radio each month. Tune in each month for insight into how you can live up to your full potential. Dr. Glenna is a physical therapist, certified access consciousness, and access body class facilitator. How does it get any better than this? For more information on Dr. Glenna Rice and her work, visit GlennaRice.com. Are you feeling stuck in unhealthy habits, toxic relationships, or low self-esteem? Do you crave a healthy relationship filled with inspiration? You might just be on the verge, on the verge of attracting your soulmate. Tune in each month to The Laura Richer Show, where dating coach Laura Richer and co-host matchmaker Peggy Bennett share tools for using your dating breakdown for a relationship breakthrough. For more information, visit richerhealinghypnosis.com. What is a brilliant culture, and how do we create them? Why are they important? Claudette Rowley has created a breakthrough five-step process to help you align your culture with your business strategy for exceptional results. Looking for a culture that drives organizational excellence? Listen to Cultural Brilliance Radio, the second and fourth Friday of each month at 10 a.m. Pacific and 1 p.m. Eastern on Transformation Talk Radio. To learn more or work with Claudette, visit culturalbrilliance.com. On Transformation Talk Radio with Knowledge Book Radio with March Batazic. I want to reiterate the websites. Um, United States General website is www.usa.theknowledgebook.net. The Turkish website for the World Brotherhood Union is www.dkbdavidkiteboy-mevlana.org.tr. My contact information is 973-787-7035 for texting and calling. And email address is mmjp99 at gmail.com. Mary Mary John Peter 99 at gmail.com. 
The Call to Friendship website is www.calltofriendship.org, all one word. So again, any comments, any disagreements, any whatever uh, topics that you would like to send me, please do so. We'll cover that in a future broadcast. Um, And we've been talking about this entire time about emotions. And basically, emotions, when we look at it from a bird's eye view, emotions are those intrinsic gut reactions that allow the body to survive, that allow us to be able to work in the world dimension, to be able to live, to be able to supply food for ourselves, to be able to supply food for our families, to be able to procreate and be able to continue our existence. And they basically are based on intuition and ego. And the driving force there is survival. Survival of the fittest, survival for ourselves. And we make ourselves the fittest no matter what we do. Now, that is basic version human 1.0. This is where we first come to be a human. This is where we first enter the evolution program. And over time, that version human 1.0 has to become and has become, for those who have undergone the last 6,000 years of evolutionary training through the sacred texts, and that human is now on the threshold of becoming a human that's a genuine human going on the path of light, going onto the path of light by going to the advanced dimensions. And in the advanced dimensions, there is no place for ego. So when you think about what the function of ego is and the function of emotions are, it allows us to exist in the world. However, when we go to the advanced dimensions, we will be at the level of a genuine human, we'll be at the level of the eighth spiritual dimension, and therefore we will be as perfect Our entire body will be as perfect as our essence, which is perfect from the get-go, from when it was created, and we will be able then to be in the advanced dimension, and the advanced dimensions at that point, we don't need ego. Ego is there to protect ourselves, to be able to continue to live on the world planet. However, in the advanced dimensions, we will have become immortal. We will not need this protection mechanism, but we will be able to serve, to love, and to be able to give whatever is necessary to those who need it. So this is where the knowledge book comes in. This is where the knowledge book programs come in because it allows the human then to progress from version 1.0 to the version, uh, let's say, the point eight meaning the spiritual dimension where we are the genuine human and allowed to go into the advanced dimensions. Now, we will have refused to function with the mammalian brain. We will have now become altruistic beings. We, have, we will have become those individuals who don't need protection anymore because we will be immortal. We will be in our true home and our true environment. Now... Of course, our physical construct is such, but we have, and we've been working on getting our higher dimensions of our brain functioning, our cortex. And this is the intellect, logic, and awareness triangle that we've been trying to incorporate. And of course, the intellect, logic, and awareness triangle is one that is closed when we are in the knowledge book studies and are following the path that we are supposed to be following. So all of this is actually a method to protect ourselves. So when our bodies, when our brain perceives something as negative, it will react to something as being physically negative. It may be, you know, it may be uh, a delicious ice cream, but if we think that that ice cream is going to hurt us, And it's a bad thing that, of course, it will hurt us. It will be a bad thing. However, if we, and this has been shown over and over again, that when an individual believes something to be good, despite the fact that it is toxic poison, it becomes good for them. And there have been studies shown that people have even been bitten by um, poisonous snakes and have not died because they have believed that 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 snake is not poisonous. 
And conversely, they have done studies under hypnosis where a person was told that they were putting their finger into boiling water and their finger actually blistered when in actuality they were put into tepid water. And it was not boiling. So it is our perception of whatever our brain brain perceives as something as negative, then it'll produce negativity in terms of its reaction, our physical body, and it then is not able to become a healthy body because it shuts down. Any negativity shuts us down, shuts the systems down, our health and reproductive and our functioning system so that we become sick. Okay. And now it is all the time that we have for this week. Just want to remind you that please do um, send us, send me any questions, any topics you would like to have covered. Um, we do have two focal points now in, the, in New York City. One is in Queens, one is in New York City. So please contact and look at the website www.usa.theknowledgebook.net. Um, look at the website for all the information there. And please join me every Tuesday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific time on Knowledge Book Radio with March Batazic. This is all the time we have. All the best to you. See you next time. You've been listening to Knowledge Book Radio with Marge Potasik. Marge was led to the Knowledge Book, a gift to humanity, and its time of transition to the golden age that provided the truth and energies and frequencies. Now, she shares information from and answers questions about the Knowledge Book with you each Tuesday at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern on TransformationTalkRadio.com. For more information, visit Marge at usa.theknowledgebook.net.